amphibian goddesses, talking vegetables, and nuclear bugs, oh my! The Shazam comic books have had quite a bizarre and colorful history. Back in the 1940s, comic book stories rarely took up more than 10 pages, and serials were even rarer. But then there was the two-year marathon Monster Society of Evil arc by Otto Binder and C.C. Beck in Captain Marvel Adventures 22 through 46. The Monster Society is an interplanetary cabal run by an unseen mastermind named Mr. Mind. He has the entire resources of the Axis powers at his disposal. Even Hitler himself happily takes orders. After months of nearly dying at Mr. Mind's hands, Captain Marvel finds out that he's actually a caterpillar with cute little glasses. But this doesn't make him any less of a threat as Mr. Mind turns the Great Wall of China into a giant shield for the invading Japanese army. This is a story so jam-packed that it introduces two unrelated underground civilizations in one five-page chapter. Other highlights include Mr. Mind firing so many German cannons it knocks the Earth out of orbit and invading Scotland in an island-shaped battleship, as well as Captain Marvel on the back of an unfrozen mammoth. Captain Marvel is many things, but we never expected Dirty Scab to be part of his resume. But in Captain Marvel and the Revolt of the Comics, in Captain Marvel Adventures number 22, that's pretty much exactly what he is. Apparently, in the Captain Marvel universe, comics heroes write and draw their own stories. That becomes a problem when stand-ins for familiar characters all walk out, including Popeye and Flash Gordon. There's also a version of Batman who wears a pair of baseball bats and has an act actual Robin for his sidekick. Holy headache! Whatever their grievances might be, Captain Marvel puts them back to work, whether by appealing to their patriotism or by rescuing his fellow superheroes from a danger even they can't handle, a mob at the department store. Some of the over-the-top flag-waving in wartime comics can seem a little ridiculous, but that's not true for every story. Some of them are very ridiculous. For instance, there's Captain Marvel Visits Portland, Oregon, or Knighthood Flowers Again in Captain Marvel Adventures number 29. Cap is promoting a scrap metal drive for the war effort when he meets with a modern-day Don Quixote named Richard Chickenheart. Chickenheart's obsession with artifacts has led him to regular spells in which he thinks he's a medieval knight. To keep him out of trouble, Billy Batson tags along as his page boy in between turning into Captain Marvel so that he can intervene when Chickenheart becomes violent. Before his mental breakdown, Chickenheart is about to melt down his priceless collection of unique historical treasures to make into guns and tanks. All his troubles turn out to be the fault of another collector named Bart Black, who wants to buy Chickenheart's collection for $5,000, which somehow makes him the bad guy. But nobody seems to realize that all that money could pay for a lot more military gear than anyone could ever get from a couple pounds of armor. In Captain Marvel's comics, natural phenomena are the work of various whimsical characters. Captain Marvel enforces the Law of Gravity, and Captain Marvel Adventures No. 31 adds the Council of Gods to the series' improvised pantheon, and they proceed to repeal, you guessed it, the Law of Gravity. Predictably, this is bad news back on Earth, where Captain Marvel zips around the city keeping people from floating off into space. Meanwhile, some gangsters take advantage of the situation by wearing spiked shoes and towing off a safe like a balloon. Once he's dispatched them, Captain Marvel chases the problem back to the council but gets stuck in the waiting room, along with a two-headed toad alien who lets him know he could be waiting for eternity. Fortunately, he has connections, since the wizard Shazam used to be on the council, and so he manages to successfully convince the council to put the law of gravity back on the books. <laughs> I can fly! Captain Marvel's adventures are full of dozens of mad scientists with elaborate schemes, but Dr. Groom from Captain Marvel Adventures number 49 goes above and beyond. In the first panel of Captain Marvel and the Unknown Killer, Groom's medical colleagues are already banning him from his brain transplantation experiments. But that night, he seemingly returns to attack one of the doctors who denounced him before Captain Marvel intervenes. As Groon tries to take out the next man on his hit list, Cap is shocked to discover he's a gorilla in disguise. You'd think the hairy arms and legs and the cheap plastic mask that doesn't even cover his whole face would have been a tip-off. 
The gorilla explains that he's the fruit of Groon's experiments and that he killed the doctor and decided he might as well kill some more doctors while he's at it. After the ape escapes to kill again, Captain Marvel takes another mask off him and it turns out that the gorilla is Dr. Groon after all. Crime is foiled, justice triumphs, and we're all left confused. I'm confused. In Captain Marvel and His Loneliest Day, from Captain Marvel Adventures No. 49, Billy Batson overhears a broadcast from the lone attendant of an iceberg monitoring station in Greenland, announcing that he's going to quit before cabin fever sets in. So Billy decides that Captain Marvel shall keep it warm himself. As it turns out, the stamina of Atlas doesn't extend to boredom, and it's only a few hours before Cap starts climbing up the walls. After 892 games of solitaire, he gets fed up enough to go hunting for someone to talk to. That leads us to the hilarious image of Captain Marvel chatting with a penguin until it eventually covers its ears with its little flippers. The absurdity escalates as Captain Marvel decides to train penguins to dance and a deer to pull them in a sleigh and also to dress up a walrus as a clown. But then a polar bear interrupts the proceedings, though after a quick beatdown it joins the circus as well. Fortunately, no one witnesses this spectacular breakdown except the old attendant, who happily takes his job back now that he has this circus to keep his mind off the solitude. In Captain Marvel in the Land of Surrealism, from Captain Marvel Adventures No. 80, Billy covers an art show by surrealist painter Leonardo Vinci. Vinci refuses a prize for imaginative art because he claims he drew it all from life. Nobody believes him, but Billy's at least intrigued enough to drive with Vinci to the Goofy Grotto where all the symbol plants and eyeball flowers from the paintings actually do exist. Cap then has to intervene when one of the creatures traps Vinci to paint him. The Captain Marvel team returned to this well four issues later with Captain Marvel and the Surrealist Imp. This time, the land of surrealism comes to Earth and artistic inspiration comes from a little cucumber-headed imp in a bathrobe. He's bored with all the dull paintings he has to send down while all the best surrealist ideas go unused. So instead of sending painter Hans Krendler what he wanted, he emerges from Krendler's canvas to inspire more surrealist paintings by turning the real world surreal. First, he redecorates Krendler's apartment with a dresser sporting human hair and ears and tongues for drawer handles. The prank nearly turns deadly when he twists the highway into a pretzel, but then of course, Captain Marvel successfully intervenes. What the hell? What? In Marvel Family No. 20, Captain Marvel and the Mistake of Father Time delivers exactly what it promises when the mystical old man accidentally leaves his hourglass upside down during a nap on a cloud. Back on Earth, Captain Marvel is musing on his failure to save a crashed pilot because he was too busy with a house fire. This could have easily been a cheap gimmick, but C.C. Beck's handling of it seems more like the work of an avant-garde artist rather than a superhero adventure. Most of Cap's adventures are as talky as an episode of Seinfeld, but Beck makes the absurdity of the situation twice as shocking by playing it totally straight. Some scenes, like the plane flying backward, play out in eerie silence. It all adds up to one of the most memorable stories from any comic of the era. Well, good luck with all that. Captain Marvel and the Dinosaur Dilemma in Captain Marvel Adventures No. 123 begins with Billy's boss, Sterling Morris, showing up to work with a baby dinosaur on a leash. Dino makes himself a nuisance in record time, tackling Billy and jumping out the window. Billy turns into Captain Marvel and rescues him, and then he investigates how Sterling found a dinosaur a couple million years past its sell-by date. He finds a pet shop on the corner offering a special on baby dinosaurs and traces them to a local farmer who found the eggs preserved in a frozen cave. For whatever reason, he decided nobody needed to know about the scientific discovery of the century except some guy who sells dog food. But that's the least of Captain Marvel's worries since all the cute little baby dinos quickly grow up and become a little too destructive. Cap pens them in and finally gets a scientist to study them, but that doesn't last long once Dino breaks clean through the fence. Cap eventually decides to load all of the dinos in a giant bullet-shaped capsule, fly it to the wizard's home on the Rock of Eternity at the nexus of space and time, and then send them back to their natural time period. 
In the world of Captain Marvel, even something as abstract as instincts can make for concrete sparring partners. In Captain Marvel Battles the Discarded Instincts from Captain Marvel Adventures number 124, a little old man discards his bad instincts not through self-discipline, but by locking them in a chest. When his wife throws it out and Sterling Morris finds it at the flea market, the instincts re-emerge in smoky trails that look like ghost versions of the Seven Dwarves. Even fairy tale logic doesn't quite cover just why the little old man seems to have only discarded animal instincts. To wit, Captain Marvel spends most of the story fighting off the instinct of hibernation. Morris thinks he can fly once he gets the instinct of migration, and the moonbang instinct makes some poor opera singer howl like a wolf on live TV. Plus, an electrician catches the lemming instinct, which makes lemmings all swim out into the ocean to die. But at least that gives us the undeniably awesome image of Cap punching a shark so hard that it goes flying backward. Pow! Right in the kisser. Fortunately, Cap's life-saving instinct is strong enough to beat out the hibernation instinct, and the little old man whistles all the instincts back into the chest. Captain Marvel Adventures number 133 gives us Captain Marvel and the Dog Dilemma, in which the title character doesn't even appear until a third of the way through. Instead, the story follows hardworking groundskeeper Herman Claude, whose duties include walking his boss's poodle, Poopsie. He starts thinking about how much easier Poopsie's life is and somehow manages to whip up an ego exchanging machine right then and there. We don't get much of an explanation for how this is possible, but at least CC Beck has some fun designing the device as Herman and Poopsie are wired up to metal caps made from a coffee container and a dog food can. Captain Marvel gets involved when Billy spots a grown man barking and chasing a cat on all fours. Meanwhile, Herman realizes how half-baked his idea was when his new owner expects him to eat dog food and do tricks and then spanks him when he doesn't. After a day of every indignity a dog can experience, Herman manages to tell Captain Marvel the truth. So Cap jams the cans back on Herman and Poopsie's heads, and everything goes back to what passes for normal in these comics. Most of these stories come from the post-war era, and this one tackles the biggest anxiety of the era, nuclear war. In Captain Marvel Battles the Bug Bombs from Wiz Comics number 150, Billy Batson tours an atomic power plant and quizzes them on their vulnerability to espionage. His guide assures him that it's airtight, except for some ants that interrupt their lunch. Alas, it turns out that those ants are little spies when the plant's radar spots the latest of several unexplained nuclear explosions in the Amazon. Captain Marvel flies down to investigate and discovers a raiding party of wasps carrying cute little wasp sized bombs. He also finds an enormous anthill and its ruler, an enormous ant. It turns out that he grew with the help of scientific hormones. That doesn't really explain much of anything, let alone why he's wearing what appears to be a baby blue Christmas cracker crown and matching boots. Apparently, the solution to bug war is bug genocide, since Cap sets off a chain reaction by punching a wasp into the atomic pile that nukes both the wasp and ant armies out of existence. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. 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 To be an underdog is to fight against the entire world, and that was literally true for Captain Marvel. Captain Marvel battles the world from Captain Marvel Adventures number 148, ditches the usual third-person omniscient narrator so that Earth can speak for itself about his annoyance with humans always digging into his skin for oil and metal. Our planet decides it's had enough and removes all the clouds to burn humanity off. All the strength of Hercules can't stand up against a planet, so Captain Marvel has to lean on the wisdom of Solomon and outsmart Earth. First, he drops an ice asteroid into the atmosphere to restore the clouds. Then, when Earth starts knocking over buildings with the roar of icebergs grinding together, Cap plugs them up with a couple of tons of felt. Finally, when Earth tries to split the Americas, Cap lifts all of South America like a continent-sized mattress and flies it back into place before gluing it together with lava. Earth gets ready to make the fight even meaner when a giant comet comes hurtling along, but Cap proves that Earth needs humans as much as they need it by annihilating the comet with a block of plutonium. In 1973, DC struck a deal with Fawcett to produce new Captain Marvel comics, and a few years later, they bought the characters outright. DC pulled in top talent for Shazam, with CC Beck returning for the first few issues, along with an A-list writing staff, including Denny O'Neill at the height of his reinvention of Batman. 
But the wacky humor of Captain Marvel Adventures was tough to recapture, and a lot of the 70s Shazam tipped it too far into plain silliness. For instance, issue number 10's Invasion of the Salad Men is exactly what it sounds like. Some vegetable-shaped aliens crash land on Earth and freak out all the locals too much to get any help repairing their ship. Captain Marvel is the only one willing to hear them out, but he learns that the repairs are well out of his price range. The solution comes from an inspired bit of silliness. Cap and the vegetable aliens make and release a movie and then collect the earnings over the course of what appears to be about an afternoon. And all that silliness is accompanied by an appropriate blizzard of terrible puns, such as, as head lettuce, I am giving the orders. During Captain Marvel's DC years, he frequently teamed up with his old rival, Superman, and their adventures rarely got weirder than Oh Captain My Captain from Action Comics number 768. Cap's sidekicks, Captain Marvel Jr. and Mary Marvel, show up in Metropolis to ask for Superman's help, as they think their leader's been turned into a disembodied chin. Meanwhile, Junior can't slow down, and Mary can only talk nonsense. Then a swarm of amphibians in the shape of one huge frog slices Mary in half. Superman finally realizes what she's trying to tell him through all the gibberish and says the magic word to become Captain Marvel. Then Supes and his body mate fly into the heart of the frog swarm and find the frog head Egyptian goddess Hecut, who is protesting all the frogs killed in cancer research. There's a lot of weirdness here, but also a lot of sincere love for Captain Marvel. When Superman defends Cap after Junior dismisses him as an also-ran, he could just as easily be referring to the character's neglect in the real world. And when Superman describes Cap's negotiation with the cut by expressing how he couldn't possibly think of anything more ludicrous or more moving, he could be talking about the best Captain Marvel stories. After Flashpoint rewrote the history of the DC Universe in 2011, Shazam got as big an overhaul as anyone. For one thing, his name officially became Shazam after years of everyone calling him that anyway. Shazam! There, son. For another thing, the compact Marvel family expanded to the six lightning-powered heroes featured in the movies. Coinciding with the release of the first film in 2019, DC launched a new Shazam comic book written by Jeff Johns. It's a strange one, not just for its content, but also because Johns seems to be constantly fighting with the material. And in the story of the Shazam family's journey through the seven magic lands, whenever the fairy tale fun tries to poke through, it's interrupted by actual or threatened dismemberment. But fairy tales can be plenty grim, too, and Johns handles that balance best with the Funlands and their ruler, King Kid. At first, it's pure wish fulfillment in the form of a world-sized theme park with unlimited free rides and candy. The Forever Young King has made it a haven for abused children, but only as long as they stay children. His own history of abuse has turned him against all adults, so as soon as his subjects turn 18, they're enslaved underground to keep the coasters rolling. That includes Billy's foster sister Mary, and King Kid quickly turns on the rest of the family when they reveal their adult super selves. 